Hello, if I can have your attention. Your attention, please. I hope you, uh, I hope you all had a fantastic meal. Uh, I, you know, again, I'd like to thank our culinary arts uh, students here who are your uh, hosts serving you and, um, and of course, creating the, the great food that you have. Uh, so we're very part of our uh, culinary arts program here at Grand Rapids Community College. Uh, I'm, my name is Keith St. Clair. I'm the incoming president for the Michigan Conference of Political Scientists, and it's my pleasure to host all of you here. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed your uh, stay, and, and I'll just remind you that we do have another panel, one set of panels uh, after lunch, so don't, uh, don't go away. And uh, I, it's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker today, who I'm sure you all, all know, uh, Mr. Bill Ballinger, uh, who publishes uh, Inside Michigan Politics and conducts political analysts. Uh, of, um, of elections, and uh, we're looking forward to what he has to say. He was um, born in Flint, Michigan uh, in 1941, and he's a former state representative and state senator uh, and ex-state racing commissioner. He's also been the director of the Michigan Department of Licensing and Regulation, and he also serves uh, as deputy assistant secretary of the U.S. Department of Health, Education, and Welfare in the administration of Gerald R. Ford, Grand Rapids Zone. So uh, that, that was something I didn't know. Uh, he holds a bachelor's uh, in degree from Princeton University and a master's in public administration from Harvard University's John F. Kennedy School of Government. Uh, he held the Robert P. and Marjorie Griffin Endowed Professorship in American Government at Central Michigan University from 2003 to 2007. And he also has um, been a visiting adjunct professor at the University of Michigan Flint and Michigan State University in Western Michigan. Uh, Bill Ballinger is a recognized authority on Michigan government and politics, and uh, everybody knows about his uh, Inside Michigan Politics, which is published, and you see it everywhere. And he's uh, recognized by uh, continually uh, serving as a guest political analyst on radio and television throughout the state of Michigan and nationally. So please help me in welcoming uh, Bill Ballinger. Thank you very much, Professor St. Clair. It's uh, great to be here with you today. I see a lot of old friends. Paul Rosicki snapping a candid shot here. Um, he, he makes great Christmas cards. I hope this isn't one of them. Uh, Lisa Lawrenson, who I know from uh, Central Michigan University when I was there, now at Delta. And uh, I've seen some other names on your program here today that I recognize. Uh, I think uh, Larry Syke was on one panel, maybe, from CMU. Um, uh, I don't know whether Del Rehnquist was here, um, but he's been here in the past. Anyway, look, uh, I thought what I'd do very quickly, uh, because we don't have that much time, uh, is just kind of go over everything that's going to be on the ballot this year, uh, just to kind of remind everybody, you know, what what's at stake here. and. Um, then open it up to questions, because you are certainly, out of all the groups that I've talked to in this calendar year, 2010, the best informed, most informed audience I've faced. Uh, no question about it. You know uh, everything that I'm going to tell you before I even say it, but let me just kind of pull it together and, and uh, go down the list and then let you guys fire away with whatever questions you have. Um, this is, I'll use this word, unique. Uh, unique is an overused word. Um, it means literally one of a kind, um, but it's abused, I think. People say things are unique and they're not really unique. But I would say uh, this year is a unique year uh, in the entire history of Michigan elections, uh, dating all the way back to 1837, because there's a configuration of things happening this year in a context that has never really happened before, and I'll just kind of go over everything. First of all, pieces of trivia that lead to this um, uh, projection by myself that this is a unique year. This will be only the second year since the year after World War II ended that all of our constitutional offices, our governor, lieutenant governor, secretary of state, attorney general, are open simultaneously, no incumbents running, only the second time. And the only other time that this was true was eight years ago 
And now that we're in an era of term limits, you know, you will probably see this a little more frequently in the future. But uh, so far, since 1946, this is only the second time it's ever happened. Here's another one that's a real shocker. This has been, I noticed you had uh, Lieutenant Governor John Cherry as your speaker last night, right? This is very interesting. This has been, this year, the first time that no sitting governor or lieutenant governor, or both, has run for governor since, anybody want to guess what year? The first year that we've had neither a governor or a, a lieutenant governor seeking the governorship, either for the first time for re-election, and I'm not talking about former governors trying to come back, I'm talking about sitting governors and lieutenant governors or lieutenant governors. 1930, 80 years ago. So in every election until this year, every election since 1930, either a sitting governor or a sitting lieutenant governor or both were seeking the governorship until this year. And so was John Jerry. He fell right in that tradition. He would have been the guy, but he pulled out on January 4th. And when he pulled out, Jennifer Granholm is term limited. There it is. First time in 80 years. So that's pretty unusual right there. Now, you look at the state Senate, 29 out of the 38 seats are open this year. That's a record number in recent history because of term limits. Only nine incumbents are running this year for the Senate. In the House, and this is interesting, 34 seats out of 110 are term limited. Now, you know, in percentage terms, that's not as dramatic as the Senate, but, you know, 34 is still a pretty big number. But guess what? In the era of term limits, these politicians are always looking for their next job. So 16 members of the House this year who could have run again for the House for a second or third term said, forget it, I'm going for the Senate, or in one case right here in Grand Rapids, they're going for Congress. Justin Amash, A-M-A-S-H, 30 years old, freshman state representative, just elected two years ago when he was 28, has given up his House seat to seek a seat in Congress to succeed Vern Ehlers, who's retired. So uh, you add 16 to 34, and then there's been a death, and there have been a couple of resignations. 52 seats in the House are open. 52, we haven't even cast a ballot yet in November. 52 out of 110 are going to be brand new faces next January. And if any incumbents get knocked off, that could be 55, maybe 60 new members of the House. So you're talking about a legislature that is going to be, you know, maybe 85, 90 new people beginning next January. So if you think we got inexperience in Lansing now, it's going to get a lot more inexperienced in the new year. And, and I will say this, and you know this, that, and I've already kind of tangentially referred to it, it is true that most of the new faces in the Senate out of the 29 new open seats are going to be former House members. So they will have some experience in the legislature, but of course, experience ain't what it used to be in the legislature. The grizzled Methuselahs who bring all this political wisdom with them have had two years of it. That's about it, that they're going to be bringing over, you know. And so, uh, it, it, you know, it, it's, it's going to be a brand new ball game. And then when you consider that uh, the new governor is going to be new, and it, particularly if it's Rick Snyder, which it looks like it will be, I mean, here's somebody who's never run for office before, never served. Um, you talk about newness, inexperience. We're going to have it in spades beginning in January. Now, there's one other race in particular, I think, people ought to really think about carefully. I know a lot of you probably focused on it already. Uh, I think it rivals the governorship in, in importance, and that's the Supreme Court. Now, the Supreme Court in this state, you probably know, it's shocking, I realize, that this is a nonpartisan office. 
but these people are actually nominated at state party conventions, and then they magically divest themselves of their partisan coloration, and they run as nonpartisan. But right now, as we go into the election, the Democrats will have control of the Supreme Court four to three. For the first time in a dozen years, they've got control of the court. Why and how? Because I think you know that two years ago, excuse me, two months ago, uh, Betty Weaver, Elizabeth Weaver, a Republican, a maverick, a maverick kind of renegade Republican who didn't get along with her three colleagues very well, resigned. And she made a deal with Jennifer Granholm, basically said, I'll resign if you appoint, appoint somebody from the North Woods uh, to replace me. That's, that's where she's from, the North Woods. And she's maintained for a long time that we don't have enough people on the court who are outside the uh, Metro Detroit Lansing axis. So we need somebody. So Jennifer Granholm dutifully appointed an appellate court judge named Alton Thomas Davis, was a circuit court judge in Crawford County, Grayling, that's where he's from. So he took Weaver's place. So um, the court flipped from being technically 4-3 Republican to 4-3 Democratic. But there are two seats up this November, and one of them is Alton Thomas Davis. Okay, so he's going to be on the ballot running for an eight-year term. The other justice who's on the ballot, you may know, is Bob Young, who is an incumbent Republican. So you got one Republican, one Democrat. They're both running. And let me just make sure everybody realizes this because it's very confusing to a lot of people. These are not two separate races. It's not like Young is running and Davis is running and they've each got opponents. No, everybody's running in a pack, a pack of five this year. It could be seven, it could be nine, depending on which splinter parties might have nominated people because remember, you don't know when you go in to vote looking at the ballot who nominated these people. You have to know that in advance. Okay, so if you don't know going into the voting booth who nominated these people, you're going to look at the ballot, and there are going to be five this year. There are going to be two nominated Republicans, two nominated Democrats because there are two seats open. There's one Libertarian on the ballot. His name is Bob Rodis, R-O-D-D-I-S. He actually ran two years ago, and he got 400,000 votes two years ago. He's an attorney from Gross Point, but you won't know he's a Libertarian. Well, you do now, but... You know, the ordinary voter going in on November 2nd will not be able to know that Bob Rodas was uh, nominated by the Libertarians unless they've studied up. So uh, I haven't mentioned the other two uh, major party candidates. Uh, Denise Langford Morris, who's an Oakland County Circuit Judge, uh, she's nominated by the Democrats to run with Davis. So they're the two Democratic nominees. The other Republican is Mary Beth Kelly. Kelly, not a bad judicial name to have, you know? Kavanaugh, Kelly, th those people hardly ever lose. Uh, but she may lose because she's not an incumbent, because the only thing that really distinguishes any one or two of these candidates from the others is what? The incumbency designation beneath their name, which here in Michigan, if you're a justice of the Supreme Court or you're a judge, for that matter, circuit, probate, district court, and you're an incumbent, you get to have that beneath your name on the ballot, and usually it's worth its weight in political gold. Uh, you get a big advantage because do you know the drop-off in Michigan from the top of the ticket races, like from governor and president, is as much as a third of the electorate, I mean as much as a third of the voters who go to vote on November 2nd will not even bother to vote for the judgeships on the nonpartisan ballot. And then those who do, they get down there and they look at these names and they say, who the hell are these people? And the only thing that really distinguishes any of them from the others is the incumbency designation. And if they haven't heard anything bad about the person, like maybe he sleeps on the bench or, or some other heinous alleged crime, they're apt to say, okay, I'm voting for the incumbent. You know, he can't be that bad. Pretty hard to lose uh, as an incumbent judge in Michigan. You have to kind of really screw up to lose in Michigan if you're an incumbent judge because you've got the deck stacked in your favor. 
So the bottom line is it's going to be a lot easier for the Democrats to maintain control of the court than the Republicans because, remember, all the Democrats have to do is get one of those people, Davis or Morris, to finish second. The top two are elected. Okay, you don't have to win. All you have to do is finish second. You're on the court. And so if they get Davis or Morris in the second place, they'll continue to have control of the court for the next two years during what important time? Reapportionment, redistricting coming up. That's why it's big. That's why it's huge. Uh, a lot of litigation will be flowing up to the Supreme Court on a lot of very important, weighty issues, but nothing really grabs the politicians like reapportionment. And I've been, you know, around observing politics since the Paleolithic era back in the 60s, and I have never seen a decade go by when the maps that have been decided upon uh, for Michigan's congressional delegation for the entire state Senate and the state House aren't decided by the justices who belong to the same party as those who gave them the map. You follow all that? In other words, if you have a Democratic-controlled Supreme Court, you can pretty much guarantee they're going to either sanction a Democratic-drawn map or they're going to make sure the Republicans don't cram th through some gerrymander and vice versa. Uh, ten years ago, the last time this was done, remember the Republicans controlled everything. They had Engler as governor, they had control of the State House and State Senate, and they had the Supreme Court under the thumb of the Gang of Four. Remember the Gang of Four? And the, it, now the a shriveled Gang of Three uh, because Taylor has been taken out. And now they're trying to come back with a remodeled gang of four because Mary Beth Kelly will probably be, a, you know, a new streamlined blonde uh, version of Cliff Taylor. So you would have the gang of four back in charge just when the maps start going through. So that, that's why this is really key. The Republicans have the bigger challenge this year because they got to sweep the board. They got to run the table. They got to win both those slots, either Kelly and Young or Young and Kelly, in whichever order. They got to finish one or two. If they do, the gang of four will be back in business, the remodeled gang of four. So keep that in mind. I know that's making Paul Rosicki nervous. I see, <laughs> I see him at Democratic State Convention, so I, I know how he feels about that race. But he's pretty mild-mannered about it, pretty gentlemanly, unlike some of these judges. They get pretty nasty at times. So anyway, that's important. Remember, we've also got our university boards. You know, we're the only state in the country, the only state that, again, I'm, this is unique, unique, that word. We are the only state that elects all three of our major higher education research university boards statewide every two years. You know, eight-year staggered terms for eight members, plus the State Board of Education, eight-year staggered terms every two years. We're the only states that does that. Most states, these people aren't even elected. They're appointed. Some states, there's some kind of combination of election and appointment. Some cases uh, where there are elections, they're done by districts within the state. We do it statewide every two years. No other state does that. Now, this will make Paul Rosicki feel good. The Democrats have control of all four of the education boards by big margins right now going into the election. Six two majorities, University of Michigan Board of Regents, MSU Board of Trustees, and State Board of Education, and seven to one on the Wayne State Board. And the worst news for the Republicans is most of the seats that are up for grabs on November 2nd this year, just because of the way the cycle goes, are held by Republicans. So the Republicans really don't have much, you know, they, to gain and a lot to lose, and they've got very little to lose because they don't have many seats to begin with. And the Democrats have less to lose and more to gain. Uh, for instance, Wayne State, uh, the one Republican on that board is up this year. If she loses and the Democrats sweep both slots, it's going to be eight zip. 
Democratic on the Wayne State Board for the first time since 1964. So the Democrats control all those there, are, you know, all those races for the, you know, for the uh, education board. We've also got a bunch of other judgeships up this year, Court of Appeals, Probate District, Circuit Court, 165 judgeships are on the ballot this year. Uh, we have got all your county commissioners running for two-year terms. There's 699 county commissioners in Michigan spread over 83 counties. Uh, in 04, 06, and 08, the Democrats net gained seats on county boards of commissioners for the first time in history. First time in history. Three straight elections, they net gained seats. They're still behind the Republicans because the Republicans represent all these tree stumps up north and, and very sparsely populated areas with few people, but in some cases quite a few commissioners. Uh, if you actually look at people represented, I think the Democrats probably represent more people, but the Republicans have actually more commissioners statewide out of the 699. They have about 46 percent, Democrats about, you know, uh, 36. And the um, uh, number of panels, that the, it, that's what it is, 46, the Republicans control 46 panels and the Democrats 36 and there's one tie. And in terms of percentage, the Republicans have about 54 percent of the commissioners, and the Democrats have about 46 percent. Um, I, I expect this year those numbers are going to change because I think this is a Republican year. I think Republicans are going to pick up a lot of seats on boards of commissioners, and they'll pick up control of some boards. None of your countywide elected officials are on this year. Sheriff, prosecutor, those people are not on. Um, you're not going to have your obviously no president, no U.S. Uh, senator, and no township officials this year. They're not on the ballot. Township officials and countywide officials, they ran for four-year terms two years ago, and they're in office until 2012. But uh, everything else that I mentioned is up for grab. Two ballot proposals, questions on the ballot. Remember, we used to have all these uh, nice little letter names like A, B, C, and D, like, you remember those ads like B is bad and D is dumb, stuff like that. Well, then somebody took all the fun out of it, and they got rid of the letter designations, and they've come up with these antiseptic numbers, like 10-1. That's what it is, proposal 10-1. Anybody know what it is? Constitutional convention. Do we want another constitutional convention? And this will be only the third time this has been on the ballot in 45 years. The language is in the Constitution now that every 16 years automatically there has to be a referendum on whether we want a new CONCON. So we've had two referenda. We've had one in 78 and one in 94. And both times it got creamed three to one. People said no. And there's been a lot of speculation this year that because of all the disgust that people feel toward politicians and toward state government, that maybe there is some restless agitation out there to say, look, uh, w everything is screwed up, let's uh, tear everything up and start over, let's have a new constitutional convention. But as soon as you start thinking that, you start thinking, well, who's going to be elected delegates to this constitutional convention? and what might they come up with that I don't like uh, as opposed to the things that I think ought to be approved? And sooner or later, people kind of decide, you know, maybe the devil we know is better than the devil we don't know, especially when you can amend the Constitution piecemeal as it has been. We have had 70 proposed amendments to the Constitution over 45 years. 30 have been approved by the voters. 40 have been turned down. So it's not as though we can't make these changes. We can make them if we want to. Maybe some of the changes we've made haven't been wise, and maybe some that we didn't make uh, would have been improvements. But the fact is we have that choice, and you don't necessarily have to pay $50 million or more, which is about what a constitutional convention would probably cost, for, including elections and everything else, at a time the state is broke to maybe come up with something that there might be a referendum on and it would lose. And then where are you? 
50 million dollars down a drain so i think it's going to lose now the second one is really kind of an interesting one proposal 10-2 anybody know what it is that's right he, he's he's much nicer about it paul isn't i i call it the kwame kilpatrick amendment i call it the, because because and do you remember marion barry well that's you know Marion Barry member was thrown in the Hooskow after being convicted on drug charges, and he was then borne up on the shoulders of the electorate and placed back in the mayoralty. And, you know, people were shocked that this happened, except in Washington, as they exercised their franchise. Actually, Marion Barry is still on the city council today in Washington. He's not the mayor, but he's on the city council. So, I mean, these towers of rectitude in Lansing decided, by God, we may be objects of contempt, but we've got some principles. Uh, we can't allow this to happen here in Michigan. We can't have somebody like Kwame Kilpatrick getting out of prison and possibly being elected governor or something. I mean, this would be terrible. So they came up with a bipartisan two-thirds majority in each chamber to put this uh, question on the ballot, if you've been convicted of a felony in the last 20 years, you cannot serve in future public office, okay? Now, I asked somebody, I said, well, now, what if somebody's an ax murderer, but they didn't do it while they were in public office? No problem. They could be governor. In fact, do you know that we have a convicted felon in the state house right now? But he was convicted of armed robbery, not when he was in public office. And now, guess what? He's going to be elected to the state senate in November, I guarantee it. Uh, his name is Burt Johnson. And this summer, he ran in a Democratic primary in Detroit against a cop. <laughs> it was the first time in history you'd had a felon and a cop squaring off, and the felon won. <laughs> so so that, that happened this summer. Johnson's going to be a senator. Um, and so we've got a lot of strange stuff going on out there, uh, even while this proposal is going to be on the ballot. I think there are good reason to vote against this proposal. I'm personally going to vote against it, but it's going to carry. I mean, who the heck wants to explain, particularly if you're a politician, to people why it's not a good idea to support this, to keep convicted felons out of public office? I mean, you can't do it. So anyway, it's probably going to pass, um, but... I'll leave it up to you whether it's a good idea. Now, I'm going to stop right there. I haven't even gone into, you know, the primary battles, the nomination for governor, Democrat, Republican. I haven't gone into attorney general, secretary of state races or any of this stuff because I figure I'll just leave it up to you. I'll mention one other thing, just one other thing. Remember our congressional delegation now, our U.S. House delegation, we've got 15. Now, I know you're a young crowd. But uh, you probably may have heard of or even remember that as recently as 1982, we had 19 from Michigan. Then we had 18. Then we had 16. And for the last 10 years, we've had 15. And now, for the next 10 years, we're going to have 14 because we're going to lose another seat after this year. So this is the last time we have 15 U.S. reps. And I hate to say it, but there's a chance that in 2020, certainly by 2030, the way things are going now, we're going to lose another one. And we're going to be down to 13. Uh, right now, we're still the eighth biggest state. But the way things are going right now, uh, we're going to be passed by states like Virginia and Georgia and Arizona. And we're going to be down to about 13th, uh, maybe as soon as 2020. So this will be the last year that we have 15 U.S. reps, and that makes reapportionment all the more interesting because you've got to take out one district, and then you've got to redraw all the other lines. Uh, the State House and State Senate, there are a finite number of districts, 38 and 110, but uh, there have obviously been population shifts within the state, so certain areas are going to get enhanced representation for the next decade based on the new map, and some are going to lose. So there it is. Just, you know, that's, that's what's out there. Uh, in the congressional delegation, four new faces automatically we're going to have beginning next January. And this is at the tail end of a decade. Kind of strange that this would happen. Uh, and we could have two more uh, if 
uh, Democratic incumbents in the 7th and 9th lose, uh, Shower and Peters, uh, although the person who would come back in the 7th is uh, Wahlberg, who's been there before, so he's not exactly a new face. But let's put it this way, six possible changed faces. And if, if you believe all the stuff you're hearing about John Dingell being in trouble, and you know Bubba's coming in Sunday to help Dingell and uh, Bernaro and Shower in the 7th District, um, if you believe that Dingell's in trouble and maybe Kildy over in Flint, you know, that's seven or eight new members. I don't think it's going to be anywhere near that high. I think it's probably going to end up being one more new member, probably the one from the first, but maybe not even that is certain. So that's still quite a bit. Uh, five out of 15 would be one-third the delegation will be new. And then all the lines will be scrambled and we'll be back to square one starting with 2012. So let me stop right there and just open it up, you know, whatever you want to ask me. Paul. Well, the polls that have been taken show the Republicans are ahead by double digits. Um, the Democrats are hoping against hope that at least Jocelyn Benson could survive. She is the Democratic nominee for Secretary of State, very attractive uh, candidate, 32-year-old Wayne State University law professor, expert in election law, uh, Harvard Law School graduate, went to Wellesley before that. Um, has been an expert in uh, national um, and other state elections. Uh, is a marathon runner, by the way. She's going to be in the Free Press Marathon this weekend. Um, and, you know, many people can't help but making the comparison with Jennifer Granholm because she came, uh, Jocelyn Benson came into the state five years ago, uh, married a guy from Michigan, kind of sounds just like Granholm. Um, Grand home, Harvard Law, same old, same old. Um, Benson obviously does not like being compared to Grand home because Grand home is not popular now. So her job rating has fallen, her personal approval has uh, fallen. And so, you know, the Democrats want to have some Phoenix rise to the a rise from the ashes of this year's electoral calamity that they see coming. And they think if they could just get a major statewide elected figure, could be anything, could be Attorney General, Secretary of State, it's attracting female, she could be a person who would be the public face of the party in 2012, 2014, whatever. So they are hoping. The problem is she's running against a pretty tough, strong Republican nominee, the Oakland County Clerk, Ruth Johnson, who has put the superintendent of uh, the intermediate school district in prison, uh, knocked off an incumbent Republican in a primary uh, six years ago, is a three-term state representative, um, and is a very interesting, tough-minded person in a Republican year. So I think right now you have to make Johnson the favorite. Uh, Layton is probably a little farther. David Layton, the Democratic nominee, is probably a little farther behind Bill Shuey, the Republican, than Benson is behind Johnson. Mainly because, sorry, Paul Rosicki, and I'm a Flintite too, a Flintstone. I come from Flint. I was born and brought up in Flint. But Flint is taking a beating in this campaign. And you've probably seen how the Republicans are depicting Layton as presiding over Murder City. And, and he, you know, he's not even prosecuting people that he should be prosecuting. I mean, these are the charges and, um, that Schuette and the Republicans are making. And so, you know, Flint, which has taken a beating in just about every department you can think of for at least a decade or two decades, is taking an even greater beating now. And Layton, you know, is, is probably trailing Schuette in the money chase. And uh, he's not a look, neither one of these guys are known down in Metro Detroit. Nobody knows who they are. So it really is going to come down to which party is, you know, having a better year and and which candidate is able to raise the most money. You may remember back in 2002, the last time this office was open, Mike Cox uh, came out of nowhere. No, he'd never been elected to anything. Uh, he was from Wayne County, which was good, but he'd never been elected. And he won in a year where Jennifer Granholm, the Democrat, had won above him. So if you got Snyder winning at the top of the ticket by maybe 15 points, we don't know what the final margin's going to be. 
Uh, it's kind of hard to overcome that if you're running for attorney general or secretary of state. Uh, you know, it can happen, but you've got to usually have somebody who's really pretty well known. And, you know, that just isn't the case. So that's the way it's looking to me. Yes, Lisa. Republicans? Okay. Okay. In other words, you're saying that. Yeah, but you're, you're saying because in an ordinary year, a lot of independents and Democrats might come out uh, they, if they think they have a better chance to win or something? Is that what you mean? In these previous years, and... Well, um, this is pretty tangled psychology here. I'm not sure I, I completely... Uh, I, I can't, I'm not sure I totally understand your premise, but let, let's just put it this way. Snyder in the Republican primary did get a lot of independents and Democrats crossing over to vote for him. If, if that, let's establish that, and I think you know that, and that's what you're saying. Um, and the, the real issue is, why did these people cross over? Did they cross over because they really were attracted to Snyder? Um, or were they people who thought, you know, this is going to be a Republican year. We're not going to be able to win at the top of the ticket unless at least make sure the least objectionable Republican, not some foaming at the mouth Christian right character, is the Republican nominee. And let's let's pick this guy Snyder. He seems at least reasonable, you know. And and the real question is, if the latter is the case, what are these people going to do in November? Are they going to stay home? because now they, they're just so dispirited, they're actually Democrats, and they wouldn't have any reason to get out and vote. Are they going to get out and vote and say, aha, we, you know, we've got Snyder out there, uh, but we're still Democrats, and we're going to come out and vote for you know, the Democrats? And, well, I would say that, is, that could be the case if Snyder had done things since the primary to turn these people off. If he had all of a sudden started sounding like some Genghis Khan of the right after he got the nomination and these people felt betrayed or at least angered that they thought they were voting for the least objectionable Republican and he actually turns out to be as bad as the rest of them, then I think what you say, you know, could be true. But he hasn't done that. You notice he said almost nothing. What has he said or done since the primary? The guy is running out the clock. You know, you don't know where he stands on anything. Nobody knows. We're buying a pig and a poke. There's no question. That's what we're doing in November. There's no question because nobody really knows. Uh, but what he's doing is he's sending out these subtle signals like he did before the primary. Remember when before the primary made an open appeal to have independents and Democrats cross over and vote for him? And a lot of them did. So who does he trot out last week down in Detroit, have lunch with him, and the guys on public radio all over the state? Who? Bill Milliken. Back from the dead. <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, Rick Snyder is the first Republican Milliken has endorsed in about 30 years. And, and Milliken is 88 years old now. Honestly, if you heard the sound bites in the last couple of days, you, you would have thought you were in a time warp. I mean, the timbre, his voice is the same, the cadence, the choice of words, everything. It was Milliken was still governor, and he was basically anointing his successor. Forget about this other 30 years that happened in between. And, you know, that sends a good signal for a guy like Snyder who's trying to reassure all these independents and Democrats saying, hey, you know, I'm the new Bill Milliken for whom they voted back in the 70s. So, I mean, I don't see... Democrats surging to the polls in November saying, by God, we got to get out there. Now we got, you know, we, we got maybe the least objectionable Republican or maybe he is his objection. We don't care. We're still Democrats. And you got to remember the big thing is the independence. I mean, what's been shown in poll after poll nationally and here in Michigan this year 
is not so much what the Democrats are doing or not doing, what the Republicans are doing or not doing, although everybody is noting that there's much more enthusiasm among the Republicans everywhere than there is among Democrats. It's what are these independents doing? In, in 06 and 08, particularly 08, these people swung massively for Obama. They, I mean, they were what really gave him his bulge nationally and here in the state. All the polls show these people have switched back the other way. I mean, if you've got a third of the electorate that has gone from being, you know, 70-30 Democratic to 70-30 Republican, that is huge. I mean, the two parties could be isolated or frozen in their positions. They could have the same turnout. They could have the same percentage support. But if you've got this massive one-third of the electorate sw swinging the way I just described, you know, that's what's really helping the Republicans this year and in other states, and it's what's helping Snyder. And so I just don't buy the premise that the Democrats are, are suddenly, that it's going to hurt the Republicans, that Snyder's the nominee. I don't think so. I think it's, it's going to help them. Yes, sir. No, you make a very good point. All I was saying is the way the table is set and the stakes and the context in which you get, that is unique. I'm not saying the outcome is going to be unique or it's going to be better. It may not be. It could be worse. It's hard to believe, but it could be. Uh, certainly the potential is there for it to be worse. If you have somebody at the helm of government who doesn't have a clue how to run state government, and then you've got a bunch of rookie rube amateurs in the legislature running around who don't know how to run it either. So there could be a problem. They'll be there. Uh, they'll be the same. That's right. No, I, I'm not disagreeing with you. Uh, it could be a calamity. Um, but, uh, you know, if you want to say the glass is maybe half full and not half empty, you know, this is a question of the optimists versus the pessimists among us, um, you can say, look, Snyder is coming in and he said all these signals that I want to work with everybody. We've got to reinvent Michigan. Remember, this is his slogan. We've got to reinvent Michigan. And we're going to start from scratch and we're going to really do some dramatic things. Well, he's got that kind of a mindset anywhere, at least he says he does. And the Republicans, his party, are going to control the Senate. In the House, we really don't know right now. I mean, going into the election, I haven't talked about this, but the Democrats have this huge majority in the, in the, in the House. Going into the election, it was actually 67 to 43 after 2008. There have been a couple of deaths, a couple of resignations. It's down to like 65 to 42 or something now, 64 to 42. So it's, it's a little scrambled. Nobody thought the Republicans could ever gain the number of seats they have to get control of the House. Now they're thinking maybe there's a 50-50 chance they could. Uh, but is that a good thing? Maybe it would be better if the Democrats still had control of the House uh, by a narrow margin, and Snyder then would have to, uh, as he's promised he will do, work with everybody, a Democratic House uh, and a Republican Senate, and do some really basic uh, surgery that needs to be done because it, there's no question that all of state government needs to be restructured and this legislature that has existed or these legislatures that have existed for 10 years particularly under Jennifer Granholm uh, have done nothing year by year but kick the can down the road that's all they've done uh, they've uh, cobbled together budgets with bailing wire and scotch tape and staple guns and gimmicks and they've run out of that stuff. In fact, this year, if it wasn't for Obama bucks and federal stimulus money, they wouldn't have been able to get it done either. And now that money's going to be gone. It's gone. So, you know, Snyder's going to come in 
in the new legislature, and they're going to inherit a $1.6 billion deficit with no Obama bucks. And no prospect, if they don't know it now, they'll never know it, that all of a sudden things are magically going to turn around in a year. I mean, that's what Granholm and the legislature has thought ever since 2003, that prosperity is just around the corner. We've had a boom and bust cycle economy in this state since time immemorial, and it's going to happen again. So 2004 is going to be great. No. Well, 2005 will be great. No. 2006, no. And on and on and on, and we are where we are right now, and I think by now everybody knows it ain't getting any better anytime soon. And we got to do something dramatic. And they're talking about selling off the Mackinac Bridge, and, and literally, they are. Uh, they're talking about doing a lot of wild and crazy things, but they're the kind of things that are probably going to have to be done. And Snyder's going to have to lead the way. Yes, sir. What went on? The context. Yeah. Well, you know, that is a very good question. I mean, you guys are historians as well as your political scientists, I know. Um, you know, it is curious that we have had new constitutions about every half century. We had our original constitution uh, in 1837. We had a, one in 1850. Now, that happened in only 13 years. Then we had another one in 1908. Then we had the one of 61, 62, and now here we are today, 2012. So we're almost as far away from 61, 62 as 61, 62 was away from 1908, or as 1908 was away from 1850. There were a couple of attempts in the 19th century. Um, they had constitutional conventions in the, like the 1880s, but the people voted down what they came up with. And uh, to, to get to your real question about the late 50s and early 60s, what happened was there was a big move building up in the late 50s uh, to have a new constitutional convention. People felt the 1908 document was antiquated and flawed, and you were electing a lot of people who shouldn't be elected. Like we used to elect the Auditor General statewide, uh, the Highway Commissioner, the state treasurer, um, the state superintendent of public instruction. They were all elected statewide every, every two years, every two years, not four years, two years. And uh, there was a lot of other stuff in there. So there was a big push, and the basic spearhead behind having a new constitutional convention was a group called Citizens for Michigan. And they were kind of grassroots activists, very business-oriented, Led by who? George Romney. George Romney, the president of American Motors, okay? So you had George Romney and the Citizens for Michigan and the League of Women Voters, wh which were a big force at that time in the late 50s. They were much stronger than they are today, and they really had the cover of being nonpartisan then. Now they've been dismissed by Republicans, certainly, as being total you know, liberal hack jobs uh, at the service of the Democratic Party. So they really have been weakened and, and marginalized. But then they were big. And then thirdly, the Michigan JCs, The Michigan JCs, who were a much bigger force at that time. And those three groups uh, made an effort to get this on the ballot. Let me tell you, it was really hard to get this constitutional convention. First of all, the language of the 1908 Constitution said, if you vote on having a new constitutional convention, it's not enough to get a majority of those voting on the question. You have to get a majority of all those showing up to vote at the polls that day. Now stop and think about it. Remember what I said earlier about judgeships and falling off? Well, you know, how many people are going to vote on this question sitting out there abstruse by itself. They may show up and vote for John F. Kennedy or Richard Nixon, or, and then they look at this and, you know, they didn't vote. So even though the thing actually got a majority of the people voting on the question, it couldn't be considered. 
So you know what they had to do? They had to go back and have another petition drive. These are petition drives to put a question on the ballot. Do we change the language in the 1908 Constitution? This is a so-called gateway amendment allowing for a majority on the question itself, not overall. And voters had to approve that. And they got them to approve that. They got them to approve that. So once they'd done that, they had another petition drive, and they put the question back on the ballot. Do we want to have a new con con? Finally, the third crack, they said, okay, let's have one. So they elected all the delegates, and, you know, they were in session, I don't know, like seven months during 61, 62. And they came up with a document, um, and it was voted on in the spring of 1963. And everybody thought it was probably going to pass overwhelmingly. It was endorsed by all the, you know, or organizations and newspapers you could hope for. It passed by 7,000 votes statewide. Barely passed. And if it had gone down, you would have had four straight elections and nothing to show for it. But the Constitution we have today passed was by 7,000 votes. And, and so here we are. The, 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 and the reason they put the language in the Constitution, we got to have an automatic referendum every 60 years. They knew what they'd been through. They said, we don't want people in the future to have to go through what people in our era went through. So we're going to put language in there saying automatically every 16 years there's going to be a question on the ballot, do you want a con con? So that some group like Citizens for Michigan doesn't have to mount their own petition drive and go through four statewide elections to et cetera, et cetera. Would what? Would would they be able to pull the same today? No. In my, no. In my view, no. They couldn't. There would have been too many groups out there. You, first of all, you would have had, you have to have a consensus, uh, yeah, really a kind of a broad consensus among what I describe as the opinion makers and the intelligentsia, the political scientists, and the people who, seriously, who really care about government and politics, the major newspapers, interest groups, and they would have to be across the board. You'd have to get, you know, left, right, labor, management, Republican, Democrat, all agreeing that, you know, this thing is really screwed up and broken and we need to do something. Have, we don't have that. We just don't have that. Whatever is wrong in, with Michigan government right now, I don't think anybody agrees it's because our Constitution is screwed up. I don't think so. There might, well, there are people out there who say uh, they can think of one thing that they're unhappy about, term limits or something else. And they say, that, you know, that's really, we ought to have a, seriously, stop thinking about it. You want to have a constitutional convention to get term limits out? You know what you, you can do? All you have to do is mount a petition drive, put it on the ballot, take it out. You know, they've tried it twice in California. It's lost both times. I mean, how did we get term limits? We got it through a petition drive in 1992. It was on the ballot. It was added to the Constitution. You don't have to have a constitutional convention to get rid of term limits. You can get rid of it all by itself if you want to. Or I think a more intelligent way, to, if that's the issue you're concerned about, is to not try and get rid of it, because I don't think you can do that, I'll bet you. Uh, you can ameliorate it, let's put it that way. You can tweak it. Uh, you could, and there are a couple of organizations that have come up with this idea, have a laundry list of, a th of reforms, like, you know, punish legislators for, you know, dock their pay if they don't show up for sessions, or establish a June 1st, deadline by which they have to pass a budget or they don't get paid thereafter. And a big list, and down near the bottom, you have something saying, okay, we're not going to allow people to serve longer in public office than they do now under term limits. It, it could be a total of 14 years right now, four, uh, two four-year terms in the Senate, three two-year terms in the House. But let's, let's modify, let's say 14 years anywhere. Okay, you could serve seven two-year terms in the House. You could serve three four-year terms in the Senate. Or you could even sell it as, we're actually going to crack down on term limits. 
we're going to make it, I mean, make it even tougher. They can't serve 14 years. They can only serve 12, okay? But it could be six two-year terms in the House and three four-year terms in the Senate instead of 14. And you could sell it that you're being even tougher on these legislators than they have it now. Well, actually, anybody who's really watched Lansing would say that'd be a big improvement because if you get somebody some longer experience in one chamber, uh, that's what it really matters. It's this hopping from one office to another. We got one guy this year who served four years in the House. He went over and served two four-year terms in the Senate. So guess what? He's got one two-year term left in the House that he can serve in legally. He's running for the House. And he'll serve this one two-year term just to be able to be down there with his snout in the trough for two more years, and then he's out. Um, so, I mean, that's the psychology. That's the mindset. So you'd have a lot, you know, you, it would be an improvement if you could do it the way I'm describing. I, I can keep going on here, but I think, but give me the hook. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Bill. I always appreciate your political analysis. Gives us lots of great uh, facts and figures to dazzle our students in our classes, right? Of course, giving Bill full credit for that. Um, you know, as Bill mentioned, I used to actually uh, work with him at CMU when he was the Griffin Endowed Chair, and I was just a lowly graduate student. So, Bill, I got to say, I like you a lot more now that I don't have to, you know, grade your papers and make all your copies <laughs> and do all your dirty work. So, <laughs> no, I say that all in good fun. Uh, Bill's a great guy, and, and we appreciated his analysis today. So, thank you so much. And uh, I'm Lisa Lorison. I am the current president of the Michigan Conference of Political Scientists. And uh, I also want to thank um, Grand Rapids Community College and the faculty here, and uh, specifically our president-elect, Keith St. Clair, for the awesome job that they have done <laughs> pulling together the conference this year. Been very well organized, very professional, and, and very impressive. So thank you so much. I know how much work goes into it, and we appreciate that. Um, at this point, we would like to start our uh, annual business meeting, and we have a couple of items on the agenda. But we would like to actually begin just sort of commemorating a dear friend and colleague of ours, uh, Jim Penning from Calvin College, uh, notably absent from this meeting. And uh, he passed away earlier this year. And I just want to invite uh, John Clark up to share a couple of words about him and um, have a moment of silence. Thank you, Lisa. And uh, many of you, of course, probably had the opportunity to, uh, to know Jim. Uh, some of you probably did not. He was a professor at Calvin for uh, a long time and directed the Survey Research Center there. He was a former president of this organization and uh, was just finishing up what was at least his second term of service on the executive board uh, when he uh, passed away unexpectedly in, in the summer. Uh, those of you that know him know that he was a, a, an outstanding scholar of American politics, had a, a real interest in religion and politics. Uh, but even if you didn't know that, you probably knew that he was a gentleman. He had a, a, a tremendous sense of humor, a little on the dry side. Some folks didn't always get it, but, uh, but a tremendous sense of humor nonetheless. Uh, we were talking to, to Corwin yesterday uh, about uh, what a great colleague he was to the folks at Calvin. And certainly just an, an all-around uh, all good guy. I got the chance to, to get to know Jim uh, before I moved to Michigan and uh, knew him, uh, I think, pretty well. Uh, and uh, when I told him that I was taking a position at, at Western Michigan, I, I just uh, remember that he seemed genuinely pleased that I would be coming up to, uh, to this part of the state, and that was a, a, a great comfort to me. He's also the person that got me personally involved in, in the conference. Uh, when he was in his uh, term as president, uh, the, or about to become president, president-elect, uh, he organized the meeting at Calvin, and I was in attendance, and he sort of pulled me aside and said, look, you know, I think this is uh, something that you ought to do. You ought to consider being on the board. And, you know, I'm pretty good at saying no to people, crazy suggestions like that. But uh, I must say it was hard to say no to, to Jim simply because of the kind of person he was and the way that he... Uh, uh, that, he, that he presented the opportunity to me. Um, so 
As Lisa said, uh, if we could just take a moment uh, uh, of silence in, uh, in his honor, I appreciate that. 